the Paid to Play podcast. Birdie and Mike Diamond, Journey Birds Wonderland. By PC Pod or Pad, you're listening to Paid to Play. I'm Rob Farker, your host for this weekly exploration of the dangerous idea that bringing your whole self, especially the bits that you worry make you seem silly, geeky, or even odd, into your income generating life is one of the best things you can do. It might not be easy, but it's easier than we think and even fear, and I want to show you how. In every odd-numbered episode of this weekly show, I chat with a career crazy, an income iconoclast, someone who has taken the things he or she loves to do, recognise that other people value the products or skills required for his or her play, and then stood by that value and asked for, and received, financial reward. Now, I need to start this episode off with a bit of a warning. Because we were having technical issues in trying to connect up, uh, I decided to try buying some Skype credit and actually calling the landline phone of my guests today to conduct the interview. Now, I thought that Skype would at least record my side of the audio Uh, at the usual quality level that it does when I have one of these chats, but instead it's actually got the both of us at phone call level. So as this interview starts, expect there to be a slight drop in audio quality. It's still fine, it still works out no problem, but I just want to make sure that you're not surprised. And one more note... During this recording, my guests made mention of a group called the Writer's Circle. In between the recording date and the live date, they have decided to depart the group. I have the pleasure of chatting with two of my partners in crime. Birdie and Mike Diamond are located in the US. They are writers and they are exploring the notions of fiction isn't. They hold to the theory that stories are already out there in the universe being lived by someone, and that all a writer needs to do is to reach out and connect with those people and the stories that they have to tell. When not writing, Birdie is often to be found singing, and Mike is often to be found looking up at either airplanes or stars, depending on circumstances. Birdie and Mike, thank you very much for coming on the Pay to Play podcast. Oh, thank you for having us. It's great to be here. I'm definitely glad to have you on. So tell me, folks, what are you digging right at the moment? What's been putting a smile on your face lately? Writing. Uh, Yeah, we've been very, very, uh, uh, getting very enthusiastic about our various writing projects. Uh, You know, getting very solid connection with these worlds and these people. And uh, I keep can't wait to get up every morning to write what's going to happen next, the next installment of what's going to happen now, you know? (laughs) And... uh, that's something that I haven't had that much excitement over in a long, long time. Mm. And it, um, it's a lot of fun. And understanding now more about how a story comes across is actually helping me actually bring it across better than I ever did before, with, before I understood what was happening. Mm. So tell me, folks, how long have you been writers? I mean, it sounds like you've been at this for a while. Well, off and on, I would say pretty much, uh, at least in my case, I know all of my life. I mean, the first story I remember writing for sure was in kindergarten, you know, so I was like five years old, and I am much older now. Mm. <laughs> I, have, I have played with writing, especially writing things like science fiction, off and on for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just that it, um, the first serious attempt at writing me and Booty were involved in is... Uh, it was about 15 years ago now we started writing uh, our, our screenplay, uh, Perry Grinnis. Yeah, and uh, that was fun. That was the one other time where, you know, get involved project, can't wait to get up to actually start working on it. And uh, we actually finished the screenplay. Uh, and uh, that's the universe that we, will, we, we are going back to uh, in another part. But that original screenplay taught us a lot about writing. Um, it didn't get sold, unfortunately, but I think it was a wonderful learning experience, and it's actually getting to a point where uh, it taught us a lot. And if I may sort of metaphorically speaking break the fourth wall here, uh, that's a universe that you, uh, Rob, are very well acquainted with because 
that's the one that, that Rob Roving is from and like that. Mm. So this is the origin story for that universe was the one that we wrote then. Um, which is also to say that, yeah, good stories never die. They just take some time to fully come out. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> 800 years later. <laughs> yeah. well, story and out of the story a couple of decades. But, you know, mm. all good. So yes, indeed. I, think, mm. I was about to say for all those folks listening along who've been following the podcast for a little bit, uh, if you hadn't figured it out before, Birdie and Mike are the folks whom I've been hinting at that I've been doing a little bit of voice work with lately. So uh, I figured it would be a um, a good idea to uh, get them on the show and you know uh, butter up the folks who are paying me to play a little bit. It's never a bad idea to uh, you know keep in the good books with those folks. <laughs> Well, there is that, and there again, the more we can get the word out about these stories, the more mm. all of us be paid to play, because we will, and you will, and it just spirals around in this wonderful, wonderful way, which is one of the cool things about being paid to play, as far as I am concerned. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, look, tell me a little bit more. Uh, Peregrinus was your first attempt at uh, writing a screenplay. Uh, or was it actually your first attempt at writing a screenplay? Had there been other works that you'd tried before? It was the first one at writing a screenplay, and it was one of the things that both Mike and I realized that that was one of the things that we liked and it, about that style as opposed to, say, a novel. And it suddenly occurs to me that I think part of the reasons why are part of why we work so well channeling our stories now because the style of a screenplay is very immediate. It's described for the camera, you know, described for the actors. It's not so much, I mean, you have to convey enough of the story that the various people that go out and create it can, but then you stop and let them get paid to play in their area. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to a novel where you are supposed to go into these major descriptions of scenes and this and that and the other, which says, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let me see if I can put my finger on what the thing is. It's like with uh, screenplay, you go from one action scene to another, uh, and you go to one, um, I'm here in this location, these two people are here, they're doing this thing, whether they're convinced to each other, fighting, having a car chase, whatever they're doing. And, uh, and when you bring across a story with a fictionism format, it's roughly the same thing. You're with the person. That person is experiencing their life at that moment, and you're trying to translate that into words. And it's very much uh, uh, a movie presentation you had pretty much. You guess, okay, what that scene? Okay, how do I got to write the scene down before I forget what it was? Um, and uh, it, it really helps you, links you to uh, the immediacy of the moment better than uh, a novel, third person, and you're being like God looking down at these people down below and you're trying to write that. That's not what happens, and that doesn't wait. never has connected with me as well as the more immediate, you're there now, you know. Yeah. And that's, that's been true for me that, that even, uh, you know, here again, that old saying about being careful about, about asking for critique from your friends, but still, what even when the stories themselves weren't as well received for whatever reason. At the same time, I always noticed a long time before I actually realized specifically what I was doing, I realized that first person was a lot warmer to me, was a lot more real. Mm. And I could get that with a lot less effort. Um, one of the things that I'm actually going to be posting on our writers or uh, our, our paid writers group later is actually a, a scene from one of the universes we're working I, I'm working with now where I tried writing it as a that third person because it was a, a different perspective etc and I was having the worst time it, it was so slow and it ended up reading so kludgy and then I was like okay I ended up making the connection with the actual person Rewrote it again from her point of view. Boom! It came out. It came out powerfully. It came out easily, and it was just a thousand percent better. It was like, okay, 
this is kind of weird, but it's a good weird, and this is being helpful. And there again, I think a certain amount of paid to play is a certain amount of pragmatism. It's like, hey, this works. This works wondrous well, at least for me, therefore. And that's one of the things now we're trying to see if this is just for us, although we think not, considering the number of authors that have said over the years, oh, yes, my character, it just they just came to life one day and started telling me, no, no, this and that and the other. And it's like from people who are otherwise just the most mundane, down, oh, good, but mundane, down-to-earth people you would meet. Mm. And I was like, okay, there's something to this. We don't know mm. what, we don't mm. know all the what, but there's something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm immediately brought to mind of one of my previous guests, uh, Elizabeth mm-hmm. Vaughan, who writes romantic fantasy novels, and mm-hmm. um, she sort of said that she had a bit of a at the end of her last book, which was War Cry, she kind of had a quick uh, couple of page note directly from the author, just sort of telling her audience what was going on and what was coming next. And she said she'd been sort of trying to uh, work out um, what the next novel was going to be until uh, one day one of the side characters from um, the previous series uh, suddenly sat down and started talking to her and telling her about his uh, uh, his story and the things he'd done. So, you know, she didn't have any alternative but to just write it. So, yes, it's it does seem to be a pretty, a pretty common story. You know, you'll have people who'll whack their head against their, a brick wall for ages trying to be a writer and then one day all of a sudden um, they won't just have an idea for a character. The character will almost just... Um, uh, not even leap off the page because the character's not even there yet. It'll just be there and going, oh, yes, and this happened and this happened. And this is how I felt about it. So I did this. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, and, mm. Mm. I was about to say, it's a strange thing sometimes. It is. And that's one of the things that I think is one of the big changes for Mike and I now is the fact that we've been exploring psychic functioning in one way and another for about more or less the last 10 years or so. And we've been um, professional channels for about, I'm going to say the last seven. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of it is getting that practice and touching that wider world, however you want to describe it past that, you know, and there again, that, that whole, you know, the, the world wide web in the other sense of the interconnected, of all of the beings and all of that. Mm. One of the things that I realized as we were doing this is having had that much practice with psychic function as we had, after a while you get a real feeling for when you're getting a psychic signal coming in. Uh, as you practice it a lot, you start feeling, wait a second, that's not from my brain, that's from outside. And uh, as we were writing some of this stuff, it dawned on us, me and Bertie talked about it, Hey, that was from outside. That's not from my own brain. Mm. And uh, once that realization came to us, I realized, you know, we live in a huge universe. Every storyline, every plot point is out there somewhere. I mean, you know, I know you can buy books saying, you know, all the different plots you can possibly have, all the different kind of characters you can have. Those books exist. I mean, there's nothing new under the sun or any sun. Uh, it's just a matter of how you execute it and how, uh, how you want to bring it across. Mm. And one thing I learned from uh, being interested in science is the fact that you cannot invent something that's not there already. Mm. Uh, you know, there's like, oh, this came out of nothing. Uh, it didn't exist before, and now it does. That's not even theoretically possible in physics. Uh, so, you know, you when you actually reach out for a story, you're thinking about, okay, I want a story about a particular kind of people, and they're in this situation, and they're doing this. And it narrows down, uh, you know, where you get the story from. And the more you narrow it down, the more you, until you find, you, you find do and do and do it until you kind of inter, uh, get introduced to your main character. In Bree's case, it was Miles Austin. In my case, with uh, Crossroads Flying Circus, it was Al Hargrave. Uh, you know, there's a world somewhere those people really exist, and... Uh, that's the, probably the English equivalent to what the names would be, you know. Mm. Uh, and there's a word, the word equivalent really is important to us because we place our stories on Earth. Uh, her story's based on, in Philadelphia. Mine's based in somewhere in a vague part of the desert southwest of the United States. Uh, it's not going to be exact because our world is not theirs. But the story, the basic points of story happen. 
And, you know, you really get a feel for what's actually going on with those people. And it's, it's really interesting. Once you realize you're talking to a person elsewhere and you're getting their story, then you realize, oh, the story's already there. I don't have to worry about plotting so much because, hey, the story's happening to them. I know what they're doing, and it'll work out in the end anyway. Just go out there, bring it across, write down the best you can, and you got yourself a good story. Hmm. And, yeah. And that's a and there again, you know, we don't know the. As I was telling Mike the other day, you know, I'm flying on inspiration and a theory. So no, we don't know everything about it. And yeah, it's in some ways it sounds at least even to my ears it sounds like oh my goodness, it's a little out there. But you know, that's the cool thing about it as far yeah. as I'm concerned. <laughs> that that cool wow, the universe really is bigger than we think and we know and like that. And it's part of the joy of discovery and just. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I think to to some degree you share the love of hanging out with good peeps because it's with what you're doing, you know, having these wonderful podcasts. So you, <laughs> I think you can appreciate when I say that's one of the things that I love is the fact that I get to hang out with even more cool peeps than I would meet other way. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's all good. And hmm. it's not biography, as Mike said. There's definitely blending like that. But, you know, there, there's... Anyway, it's so cool that I, I spaced the rest of my sentence, but it's just, that, that's it. To me, it's just so exciting and mm. wonderful that, you know, we're exploring this and, and the discoveries we make. Indeed. And, uh, there's yeah. groups that other people do this, too, though they don't always realize uh, precisely what's happening. But you hear so many authors talk about, oh, my characters came alive. Mm-hmm. You know, the real people, they refused to do what I wanted to do. They <laughs> did with the whole thing anyway. I showed down what they really did. Yeah, uh, I've said that many times from authors, and you were right. just you were just saying. So yeah. So you know, mm-hmm. you have uh, all this history of people doing that. It lends us to the point where, yes, this is something people really can do. Everybody has the ability, one way or another, to do this. It's a matter of getting them to understand this is what's really happening. Trust is out there, and trust that they're going to bring the story across. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, it, it's oh, there's one thing I was going to mention. This wasn't about writing per se. I found something on uh, Facebook the other day where somebody was talking about uh, this one um, person of interest in music, not really professionally trained, just a fairly average person, but ever interested in music, started channeling, bringing it across uh, high level symphonies and stuff done by uh, dead composers. Mm. And yeah, I think I saw something about that as well, yeah. Along, uh, so one thing to make a claim about that, but some totally different to have show the compositions that she brings across, take it to a professional, have them say, this is too good to come from just an amateur who doesn't know, who really haven't been professionally trained. This had to have come from somebody who really does this really well. And it was in the style of some of the old composers and stuff. I mean, that's, you know... Maybe not fiction isn't, maybe music isn't, but uh, it's the same process only in music. Mm. And uh, I I was reading that uh, on a a Facebook group that I belong to, and and, and it was really interesting. Uh, And I've heard something similar to that before, Mm. and uh, when I saw that, I Mike, if I can cut in a bit, you did say something a little bit earlier on that I'm interested in asking you about. you both about a bit more you mentioned that you are for the last few years you have been professional channels so from the sounds of it you've been taking this process that you've been talking about this um uh this means of channeling energy and stories that you're getting from elsewhere and uh effectively applying it for the last six years can you tell me a little bit more about that well it's um if I'm understanding you correctly, it's sort of the other way around okay. um, in that we, uh, yeah, it's one of those, it all started with a story called Witchblade. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I know you, you have a preferred length to your podcast, so I won't tell, uh, do the whole story, save to say that we met our um, the lady we're sharing her house with uh, through this, this story of Witchblade and ended up moving up here and ended up being reduced. Um to a gestalt called Jacob, channeled by Judy Crooks. Uh, we ended up learning a lot of life 
skills and things from them, and eventually they taught a channeling class. Both Mike and I attended, and I know I did, and I believe he did too, having, oh, my God, this is what I've been doing all my life. <laughs> we had a name. We had places to practice and things like that. So we started channeling in the more traditional, if you can yeah. say such a thing, way of guides, and we realized that it was a communication tool. Yeah. So we started talking. We were curious. So it's like, okay, if this is a communication tool rather than just some special snowflake thing, can we talk with other people? So we every started. Time, every time we asked, the answer was yes. And, and it sort of went on from there. So, yes, we yeah. uh, and Because that's the yeah. one thing that most misunderstood about channeling is at the end of the day, it's a communication tool. Mm. Yeah. Period. That's, that's, that's what it is. Whether you're talking to guides, whether you're talking to, uh, you know, people from somewhere else, or whether you're talking to uh, people still hanging around as, Ghosts, whatever, whoever you're talking to, whatever you're talking to, you're still communicating uh, using a different format than the uh, vibrating ear that's causing the sound coming in my mouth. Uh, you know, you're using a, a, the connection that all entities in the universe have catching everybody else. Uh, since we're all connected in that way, Communication psychically is possible from anybody to anybody at any place within space time, pretty much. Mm. Um, and so, you know, once you realize, hey, I can communicate, then you find that if you inquire your mind and then put the intent, I want to speak to so and so, assuming they're agreeable, you know, you can get in a conversation. So, 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 assuming both of them are trying. And both of them have a certain amount of psychic talent, you know. It runs the gamut from, you know, uh, pretty bad to pretty awesome and everything in between. Um, you know. We are bored. <laughs> yes, yes. I have had uh, some interesting conversations with uh, some other people, and some of them are amazing to all that. Yeah. Mm. Um, but there again, you know, yes, you'll just have to invite us back because there are so many stories, so many more that can fit in one show. <laughs> Indeed. So, well, keeping on focus at the moment, speaking about stories and uh, uh, Peregrinus and um, how I got involved with you, of course. So at the moment, you are working on a way to take this script that you've had um, in the trunk for a good few years now and actually turn it into um, a published work and you were looking at doing it through the format of a web TV series so tell me a little bit more about how you came around to um, uh, deciding to pick up with Peregrinus again after it being on hiatus for, uh, hiatus for a while and uh, how things have been going so far with uh, getting it off the ground again well there again, thereby hangs a tail, in this case called 42nd Street, which is not ours. But um, there is such gorgeous energy, and the people that I was singing with and Mike was working with were just so awesome, and the story just really started sparking. Um, so even when we wrote the original, para, uh, it was written with, with another friend of ours, when we wrote the original screenplay, it was set back in medieval times. 1193. Right. But then we always knew that it was sort of Highlander-esque in the sense that, that there always was a modern version. And it, you know, there again, some of the, okay, things we need to revise and like this and that. And it just dawned on me, this is too good of a universe to leave alone. But at the same time, I do not, I'm not in a place where I want to revise it for the 16th time. So, and because of the theater group, and there again, what is that but a perfect place for a true bear through the door of the modern age to be? Mm -hmm. um, so I, we, I started playing with that thought of, yeah, okay, fine. If he wants to change the world in this modern way, how would we do that? Mm -hmm. um, there again, I know that I channeled a lot of the good energy that we were creating during 40 seconds. We put it out to the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably never know the ripples, but I know they're out there. You know, so what, yeah, how would he do that? And that started sparking. Um, and, and, you know, there's a bit of, you know, in his 
in between times he had been a rock star. That was a picture I got when we first started. When we were writing the original screenplays of one of the things that happened in more modern times. Mm. Um, so, just, so these people, these yeah. two guys who start out eleven ninety three, the Joffrey was uh, Trevere, uh, Jean was a Burgundian knight at the dinner time. Uh, fast forward to today, uh, <laughs> they still exist. It's, um, they have. Um, Oh, they are pretty little outside of time these days. And uh, these days, uh, uh, he's in our time period to work on a particular project that will remain vague for now because it's part of the story. You have to see the story to uh, get it. Mm. But uh, he's doing it from a point of view of people's entertainment. People go to be entertained, and they can influence people's thoughts through the entertainment. And John's there both as his security as well as doing things his way. And um, he's somewhat more direct and pointed, shall we say. Um, so, mastering pointy things from time to time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, so there again. And, it, you know, it's not meant in any particular, like, scary, ooh, mind control, but just, you know, there again beaming hope so to speak mm. you know yeah you don't your life sucks you don't have to stay there there are there is something you can do to change it it may not be everything but there's at least something yeah that kind of thing mm. you know which is one of the huge things i got from 42nd street um ended up being a rather dramatic turnaround but <laughs> um you know i was there again yeah you can do it mm. you know, depending on where you are it may take more work and certainly has but you know, we're in process and like that. Mm. Okay. A lot of it, oh, I was going to say, and the biggest thing was saying, I'm a writer. I had a major health issue as part of that journey last year, and one of the things I saw when I was sitting and recuperating was I saw a PBS show where the gentleman was mentoring a bunch of writers, and he was talking about the fear, and he said the quote is, you know, you know, who are you to be a writer? Who the hell are you not to be a writer? And it's like that was so freeing for everybody on the show, and it was freeing for me, too. At the time, I thought it was about singing, but then I realized when I came home and was, you know, getting my life back that, no, this was about writing, which, I, like I said, I'd loved, but I'd given up for a lot of years for a lot of reasons. And so part of that for me was just saying no with the same clarity I used to get myself back to health I am a writer, and this is what I am going to do. I am going to get paid to play by being a writer by Gumby. <laughs> so how, um, where are things at at the moment? What are you actively doing uh, to be bringing uh, Peregrinus to life? It's, uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, it is, of course, a web series. You're looking at Patreon uh, for funding. So, yeah, tell me a little bit more about the work you've been doing, not just in writing it, but also um, in getting it out there and turning it into something that you can get paid to play to do. Oh, and there's the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it, well, yes, because that is still our ultimate goal, is to bring these uh, shows to life. And considering um, some of the interesting that's a good word for it. Things mm-hmm. that happen when you end up having to write by committee. I, I'm assuming this is unfortunately similar in Australia. It's definitely here, true here in the States that, um, that people have taken, that have great shows that are killed because of all the, the networks and the this and the that and all the people that have to sign off on things. And then, and then hopefully at the end of all that, you have something that the fans like. Yeah. Um, it's, it's basically creating a, a new way of presenting material mm-hmm. to where we can keep control um, of the project so we can have a story be the way the story's intended to be. Uh, and for, for now, basically, the Patreon model of trying to get people uh, over there to help uh, bring up some money so uh, we can gradually work our way up to a uh, web series for... Right. And specifically with that, what we're doing right now is um, something, a couple of things that we're and if, when you go to check out the Patreon page, you'll be able to read more about these. But basically, we're, we're developing the Bardic Circle. And, and within that are a couple of smaller subsets. One's the Reader Circle, one's the Writer Circle. The Reader Circle is where we're sharing our fiction. Um, and then the Writer Circle is 
excuse me, where we're sharing our techniques about fiction isn't. Mm. Uh, yes, <laughs> he is a great lubricator. Anyway, um, <clears throat> that. So there is that, and yes. Um, Peregrinus is not actually one of the, currently one of the worlds, but there again, that's because, as I said, that universe was created with another friend of ours, so we need to work out some legal issues with her. I mean, not in a negative way, but just, you know, making the, making sure the way you stay straight, I <laughs> yeah. think, to where the, the, the couple of universes that the three of us developed together, whether, and those may get presented in another place, in another way. But part of it is the fact that even internet tele, it takes money. It takes gobs of money. Mm. And it's also going to take time for us to make the connections for the things that, that, which are legion that we don't know about how to actually make a television show of any, any destination. <laughs> so sort of in the middle, or in the meantime, so to speak, is get our name out there, get ourselves known as writers, like, so people can learn to trust it. Yeah, the diamonds, they make good stories. So yeah, when it happens that, you know, they'll they'll come see it and like that, but they'll also as a trust, hopefully they will also come and support us in that end goal of yeah, oh my god, I would love to see this come to life like that. So yeah, sure, let me join and support and you know, I'll oh, step one things. step one is develop a fan base. Yes. Mm, <laughs> mm. Basically what what what's going on right now is the only can to develop a fan base, get a lot of fans, because it's going to take a lot of people, a lot of people's help to build up to the point we can actually do uh, even the, uh, the first steps um, of getting something out there. You know, maybe having um, uh, some sort of project initially that doesn't require quite as big a cast, or maybe can be filmed locally with probably just a few people, uh, very indie, you know, uh, indie production, and uh, and get, get out there and start to build a, a fan base on the internet as well, uh, as far as the video internet, and then work your way up to the point where as we get bigger and more powerful, we have better equipment, more, more cast, more professional, you know, uh, production quality, that kind of thing. Yeah. And one of the steps, you know, sort of in between that is the audio work, yeah. you know, such so as doing. And um, I was talking about that with our friend. And because the thing is, the original screenplay was written for a specific actor back in the day. Now that person has decided to have their career on the other side of the camera. But there was one of the other people that we were thinking about um, who also at least heard enough of the idea at the time to uh, at least express some interest in it that we are, that would still actually um, be potentially a good fit. So as we get there, you know, part of it is approaching this person and saying, hey, would you be willing to voice you, your character at least, and even just there do some audio production yeah. because there again, that's going to be a lot cheaper, but it gives people enough of the taste of the universe to be able to say, yeah, I want more of that. Mm. You know, maybe like having an uh, audio uh, read-through, you know, uh, maybe right. like, a, mm -hmm. uh, like a radio production type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or the, um, a borrow an idea from the people who had done the uh, uh, 42nd Street, have a, a concert version only without the music, obviously, of, uh, of these where people actually telling the dialogue and other ways of telling the story. And without needing as much in the way of that, meaning as much of the way of the other stuff you need uh, for a full, you know, there are steps on the road to uh, a finished product of actually having a professional TV show done for the internet. Mm. Uh, but uh, so, so the audio is, is going to be a good start. Um, uh, you know, starting with Rob Roving and working way up to some of the other characters. Um, and at the end of the day, it all starts with writing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Writing and then sharing. Um, you know, I it's and I know we are far from the only writers who are sometimes a little bit shy about saying, "Oh my goodness, I am writing about these cool people. Come, come read and, and meet these cool people too." And it's you know, but 
since we both have that desire to be paid for our play, we know that we need to work on that, which is part of the reason why we're here, um, helping to say, yeah, we're, we're writing about these cool people, and, and I, we really think you would love to read about them too, and come join us, and like that. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, um... That's actually answered the question somewhere else. <laughs> I, think it, I think it has. So, uh... If there were, uh, and actually, uh, before I ask you the the dreaded three questions, um, I, if you don't mind, I wanted to have a very quick geek out with you. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier on that um, this all kind of uh, your your move and um, various other events in your life kind of started through Witchblade, which mm-hmm. I understand to be, of course, uh, a comic book. From Top Cow mm-hmm. Productions, it was was that where you guys got involved with it, or was it the TV show that they made for the a little TV while show. back? Ah, <laughs> the TV show, yes. Ah, no, yes, I, yes. Mm, I had to ask because uh, it's been put out recently that um, uh, the Witchblade comic book itself is uh, is coming to an end. Hmm. Mm. Okay, that I don't know one way or the other. Yeah. Um, we are. Huge fans of the show, not so much the comic, I must admit, and I'm, I've, you know, there are a very few manga that I love, but I admit to not knowing a whole lot about manga as such, so that version of Witchblade, I am even <laughs> more or less knowledgeable about, ah, no worries. even than the original, but yeah, so, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, but, you know, it's like a, been a long run. It certainly so. is, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, especially if independent. Mm. But yeah. Well, look, anyway, so if there were three questions, uh, not three questions, three things that um, uh, when you'd started out on your journey, you wish that maybe someone had, someone had told you that might help somebody who is right now looking at their own kind of pay-to-play journey and just figuring out um, how to get started, what would those three things that you could tell that person be? Okay, one... Uh, if you start out deciding, hey, I want to be a writer, uh, don't let anybody, anybody change your mind. Uh, seriously, uh, people, there's always uh, those people out there who have 5,000 reasons why it can't be done. Uh, you run into one of those, you find yourself trying to do something else, and that's not going to work because if you're intending to be a writer, somehow the universe tries to make you a writer. And if you don't, things don't go well. Uh, so, if you intend to be a writer, stick with it. Don't give up. Uh, that's the first thing, is not giving up, and don't let uh, these uh, negative people influence you on del- unduly. Uh, there's always going to be some work for people who are good. Uh, the big thing is to be good. Um, I think that's the first thing I would say. Yeah, that was going to be my first one, too, is, you know, people who say you can't, constructively ignore them because there again sometimes they have valid points you know it's like when you end up you know sabotaging yourself or whatever often there's a part of you that has a valid point that that and that point does need to be addressed in one way or another but the thing to remember is there's always a third option again borrowing from which play <laughs> it's talked about third options a lot but it's very true so it's like okay so maybe you don't you, you're not financially ready or comfortable with quitting your job, well, fine. You know, 750words.com, put your butt in the chair every day. 750 words, not that's that many. Number two is yes. words.com. Now, a lot of the things that I would recommend are things I would recommend now that ne- didn't necessarily exist back then. <laughs> things like 750 <laughs> words, mm. things like uh, Jeff Gowen's book, The Art of Work, which talks about callings, uh, which is just fantastic, and I highly recommend it to people in general. But definitely, and, you know, stay teachable, stay open, but stay strong at the same time. You know, hold that clarity um, and just allow yourself to feel that clarity. Um, And I I would also definitely say learn to listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. And there again, kind of pretty much regardless of whether people who poo you for that or not, there's a lot of fantastically wealthy people in the world who certainly did listen to intuition, even if they might not, might or might not have called it that, but still they were very good at playing hunches mm. and knowing when to do that and when not. 
Um, but definitely honing your psychic functioning in whatever way you're willing to be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's and the third yeah. one. Uh, I would, Keep going. I mean, you know, you know, I think yeah. flexibility. It's one thing to mm-hmm. have a, a goal in mind of where you're headed, like say for writing or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, sometimes the path there uh, has unusual routes. Uh, be flexible-minded. Be be willing to try different things. Like right now, one thing that's oh. I've worked in two different bookstores. I know a ton of it about the publishing industry. It's changing. It's not what it used to be, and it's not what it will be 20 years from now. So, you know, since the model of publishing is changing, whether anybody wants it to happen or not, it is. Uh, it, it, for a writer, you've got to be flexible because uh, the route to money and the route to success is not what it used to be. Uh, the same is going true, speaking of the movie industry. Uh, you know, there was a time not long ago where it's all about major studios in Hollywood. Now, a lot of movies be done everywhere, in most every country, uh, and with indie productions, small productions, big productions. A lot of stuff don't even get to the movie screen. They go straight to DVD. Uh, there's an amazing amount of emphasis on Internet TV. Uh, there's a lot of very professional stuff being done that's not necessarily stopping and asking uh, Mother May I to the uh, big uh, studios that used to be at one time they had to. Uh, so a lot of things in all kinds of media is changing drastically. You've got to be flexible. Mm. I think that's one. I do, and I, I know, I do totally agree with that, definitely, flexibility, because, you know, there again, it's that, that variation of be flexible, but also be clear and hold to that clarity and take the steps and just understand, you know, that 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 uh, saying about the you know journey of a thousand miles, you know, begins with a single step, and then but there's also all the other ones after it, and just remembering that no, you know, like you most of us, as far as I know, pretty much none of us have thousand league boots, so you know it's going to take a lot of little steps to get there, but you can get there. Mm. I think that's one of the things too is it's possible. Definitely holding that thing is possible. Uh, yeah. One is a, a short a, and very interesting story. There again, another, uh, there was a, a, we attended a writer's workshop. One of the, our fellow people had expressed interest in a character, and we were curious. So, so we asked to speak to the real world counterpart of, of this character. And they were fascinated by the laptop because their, their culture was at a much earlier level of technology, and they were absolutely fascinated by it. And the big thing they were saying was that knowing it was possible was a huge thing, that they knew that, no, they're not going to, you know, get to microchips and like that right away. There's places in between. But knowing that this thing exists out there, let, you know, frees them to experiment to find their version of, you know, the printing press, typewriter, yada, yada, all those, bit, all those machines that were invented in between. Yeah. yeah mm. and it's very important to realize what's possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an amazing amount of people in the world who have no idea what they're talking about, who's willing to stand up on a chair with fish rays and say, this is impossible. And almost every single case is wrong. Uh, you know, don't don't be dissuaded by the impossible people to being small minded. Just stick with what you're being know impossible. impossible. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, impossible people are being impossible, and therefore you are free to ignore them. Indeed. So after hearing this episode, where can people find you if they want to find out a little bit more about you folks and what you are doing at the moment? All right. Well, one one good way is to. Uh, do a search for Wonderland RBBT on your favorite um, social, social media. media. Thank you. Uh, we're there on uh, we're on Twitter under that. I'm usually the one tweeting on it, but you know, I, one of us is um, Facebook. We have a Facebook page under that. Pinterest, YouTube, things like that, uh, and our Patreon page. Yeah, <laughs> remember the Patreon page, <laughs> definitely. Uh, we're also, um, I'm, uh, Mike and I are both on Archive of Our Own, which is a place for fanfic. I'm on there as Bardic Raven. Mike is on there as Mike Diamond. Uh, and we're both on Tumblr. Um, I'm under Blackbird Tells Tales. 
and uh, Mike from above. Ah, yes, Mike from above. <laughs> so those are pretty much, um, you know, there again, also doing a, a search up for Birdie Diamond and Mike Diamond. Well, you know, like for Facebooks and things like that. <laughs> no worries. Well, Birdie, Mike, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you very much for coming on. Well, again, thank you for having us. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much. It means a lot to me that you are downloading this episode and getting it between your ears. And I hope that the chat in this episode was of help to you. Now, there are a couple of things that I would like to ask you to do for me. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to it on iTunes or your preferred podcast aggregator. And while you're there, could you give it a rating and leave a review, please? Also on social media, could you like, favorite and share it? The Paid to Play podcast has pages on Facebook and Google+. Please like the page or add it to your circles as appropriate. Like plus one and share the episodes. And also join the Facebook group Fans of the Paid to Play podcast. There is also a Paid to Play podcast channel on YouTube where I upload the episodes. Please like and share them and I would love to see your comments there. If you are a Twitterer, I am there as well. You can follow me at ByRobF. That's Bravo, Yankee, Romeo, Oscar, Bravo. Foxtrot. I tweet the episodes on there, so if you could please favourite and retweet as well. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I would love it if you could sign up to Patreon and back the Pay to Play podcast. You will find the Patreon page for this podcast at www.patreon.com. That's Papa Alpha Tango Romeo Echo Oscar November.com forward slash paid to play, all one word. Patreon is a crowdfunding website where instead of backing a specific project once, people back ongoing projects like podcasts on a per month or per episode basis. You'll find my milestones and goals for the Patreon campaign there, and it would be great if you could get behind this podcast on a financial basis, even if it's just for a dollar an episode. It will help me make the podcast bigger and better. I will be able to put a little bit more time and cash into it, and that way it will be able to better help you get paid to play. Now, next week's episode is going to be an even episode, which means it's Money Where My Mouth Is, Musings and Mailbag. It's where I talk about my own progress toward getting paid to play, put a little bit of overthinking into some of the issues I've encountered and the overall idea of taking what you love doing and asking people to pay you for the products and skills of doing what you love. And I also answer your questions and read out your feedback. So I would love any mailbag submissions you might have. You can get in touch with me via any of the aforementioned social media. Uh, You can either leave a comment on the page or send me a private message. You can also email me at podcast at robf.com.au. Please indicate that your comment or email or private message is a mailbag question and that you're okay for me to read it out on the episode and also whether you're okay with me giving your name or online ID as the person who submitted the feedback or question. And if you've got multiple online IDs, please let me know which one you would prefer me to use. I am not a psychologist or trained therapist or coach. I'm just a guy with a mic and a dream and a little bit of experience and perspective. But again, I would love to hear from you. So until next time, this is Rob Farker asking you to stand by your play. You might be surprised how many folks appreciate it. I license the interview and monologue content of the Paid to Play podcast under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License. That roughly means you can sample, remix, and redistribute it as long as you tell people that the bits of it you use came from Rob Farker and don't charge anyone for your work. 
For the full legal text, go to creativecommons.org. The theme music is written, performed by, copyright and used with the kind permission of Miracle of Sound. All rights reserved. For more great music inspired by geek culture, check out miracleofsound.net. This podcast is hosted by Business Web Integrations. Get in touch with them at businesswebintegrations, all one word, dot com, dot au, to discuss your web hosting and business needs.